soup teachers. Soup teachers, we called them. The women who stood behind the cafeteria counters and dished it out. Fish sticks, undocumented meat, soup. War widows, then wives of the war wounded, then the women who worked in war industries, of whom my mother was one, got first dibs on these jobs. It wasn't a law, my father said, it just was. My father was deferred for reasons of agriculture. During another war, I too was deferred for reasons other than agriculture. Though shortlisted for soup teacher, my mother took another job that better suited her soft and sonorous voice. She was the one, when you picked up the phone, who said, number please. She lost that work when dials came in. Her voice was sweet, but she couldn't sing, so she used it less and less. My father was mostly deaf until she never spoke three syllables in a row again. Poetry is about being alive and walking around on earth with your eyes and ears open. And uh, I believe, in fact, there's only two, two themes in all of poetry, and, uh, and that is love and death. Uh, uh, any, virtually any poem you showed me, I could show you how it fits under one of those categories. And death is, and I don't mean that in a morbid way, it's just the, this notion of mortality uh, that, that every one of us has to deal with at one time or <laughs> sooner or later. But it's an art form, it's a craft, uh, just like, like any other. It can be taught, you can get better uh, at it uh, if, if you love it, uh, but it mostly is work, uh, just like anything else. It's it's work. It's uh, it takes stamina and and doggedness, and uh, uh, you have to be able to write even when you don't feel like writing, even when you're uh, so far away from being inspired about anything. To me, it's a process of discovery that starts with a little thing, maybe a little rhythm, maybe a title, maybe a couple lines or an image, and then I just work on it uh, over and over and over again. There's, I don't think there's ever a poem that I published in a book that I didn't do at least 15 drafts on and over a period of months, uh, and uh, sometimes many more than that, uh, over a period of many months, gradually. It's a, for me, it's a process of kind of accretion, uh, building up a poem very gradually. Poetry is an art form, it's a craft. But just like any other art form and craft, when you're done with it, it's supposed to seem spontaneous and just inspired. If you're watching an actor and you know that they're acting, that's bad acting, right? Uh, uh, it, it's about creating an illusion, uh, creating an illusion of this is something that just fluid, uh, uh, spontaneously came out of this poet's uh, pen, uh, but, but in fact, to create that illusion, I, anyway, have to sweat blood. This is a, a poem by the great, great Chilean poet, uh, Pablo Neruda. It's called uh, Ode to Tomatoes. The street filled with tomatoes, midday, summer, light, is halved like a tomato. Its juice runs through the streets. In December, unabated, the tomato invades the kitchen. It enters at lunchtime, takes its ease on countertops, among glasses, butter dishes, blue salt cellars. It sheds its own light, benign majesty. Unfortunately, we must murder it. The knife sinks into living flesh, red viscera, a cool sun, profound, inexhaustible, populates the salads of Chile. Happily, it is wed to the clear onion, and to celebrate the union, we pour oil, essential child of the olive, onto its half hemispheres. Pepper adds its fragrance, salt its magnetism. It is the wedding of the day. Parsley hoists its flag. Potatoes bubble vigorously. The aroma of the roast knocks at the door. It's time, come on. And on the table at the midpoint of summer, the tomato star of earth, recurrent and fertile star, displays its convolutions, its canals, its remarkable amplitude and abundance. No pit, no husk, no leaves or thorns. The tomato offers its gift of fiery color and cool completeness.